Welcome back to part two in the series on loops. In this video, we'll introduce our first loop structure, for loops. A for loop is so called because surprisingly, it uses the keyword for. The three main elements, the initialization, the initialization, continuation, and increment are all conveniently placed in the same line and enclosed with parentheses. The final element, the loop body, is placed immediately after and enclosed in curly brackets, just as with conditional statements. Here's a simple example that performs the basic loop from the previous part that counts from one to 10 and prints out each value on its own line. Here's the initialization statement. It's executed only once before the loop begins. In this case, it initializes the variable i to one. Next is the continuation condition, which is evaluated before each iteration of the loop to determine if the loop should execute at least one more time. We'll continue this loop while the value of i is 10 or less. Thus, we'll terminate this loop once the value of i exceeds 10. The iteration is here, and it represents some new syntax that we'll cover shortly. For now, understand that it simply adds one to the variable i. The iteration statement is executed at the end of each iteration of the loop. The loop body is denoted with opening and closing curly brackets. The code inside this loop will execute each and every single iteration of the loop. Note the usage of semicolons in this loop. There are semicolons at the end of the initialization and continuation elements, but not the iteration statement. This may seem odd since the iteration statement is an executable statement, and I would agree that at the very least it's inconsistent, but it is what it is. Also note the style elements. The opening curly bracket is on the same line as the for statement, and the closing curly bracket is vertically aligned with the keyword for. The contents of the loop are all indented. Though there's only one line of code in this example, if there were multiple lines, they would all be indented consistently. To understand this a little bit better, let's take a look at a code demonstration of this example. Here I'm using a code visualization website. We can step through each line of this code and look at the value of i, as well as the output. Before the loop begins, the value of i is undefined. At the first iteration, it's initialized to one and is less than or equal to 10, so the loop executes and prints one. At the end of that iteration, i is incremented. Its value is now two. So when we print it out, it prints a value of two. and so on and so forth. At the end of each iteration, i is incremented by one. At the beginning of each iteration, it's tested against 10. While it remains less than 10 or equal to 10, the loop will execute. When it increments to 11, the loop terminates and normal control flow is returned. At the end of this loop, i is still in scope, but it has a value of 11, and so it wasn't printed. There are several common shorthand operators for incrementing and decrementing the values stored in variables, since these are really common tasks. As we saw, i++ adds one to the variable i i minus minus subtracts one from the variable i. Each of these are equivalent to simply adding one and reassigning the variable value or using the subtraction operator and the assignment operator respectively. We say equivalent, but they're not exactly equivalent. They have the same effect, but they're different operators with different orders of precedence. You may occasionally see similar operators that have the same effect, but slightly different behavior. These are called the prefix incrementers. We won't go into the details here, and we'll stick with the postfix operators. You can also use other compound assignment increment operators. For example, a plus equals 10 adds 10 to the variable a. This operator allows you to add values other than just one. Likewise, using minus equals allows you to subtract values. This example subtracts five from the variable a. You can also use the multiplication operator and the division operator to modify variable values. Again, each one of these operators is, strictly speaking, not necessary. We could have achieved the same effect with the assignment and arithmetic operators. The purpose of these additional operators is syntactic sugar. They provide shorthand ways of doing common operations, giving a language more flexibility. 
Let's write a few more simple examples of for loops. Here I'm using a website called REPL. It'll save us from having to write, compile, and execute, but it's not a full-blown development environment. Let's write a loop to print the numbers 10 through 100 by increments of 10. We initialize i to 10. That's where the loop starts. While i is less than or equal to 100, we'll execute this loop. Now here's a perfect opportunity to simplify the syntax. i is equal to i plus 10 can be achieved with simply just i plus equals 10. And it prints values 10 through 100 by increments of 10. What value does i have after this loop? Let's add one more print statement after the loop to find out. The last iteration of that for loop had i equal to 100, and so it printed it out. At the end of that iteration, 10 was added to it, giving it a value of 110, which was not less than or equal to 100, so we broke out of the loop, but it still retained that value. Let's write a loop to sum up the numbers 1 through 10. First, let me put the value 10 into a variable. We'll also need a value to keep track of the sum. This is similar to the loop from before, but instead of hard coding 10, I've placed the value into a variable that we can either read in from the user or we can change. This makes the loop a little bit more flexible. Now to compute the sum, we simply add i, which goes from 1, 2, 3, up to 10, to the running total stored in the variable sum. But again, here we can use our shorthand. Plus equals has the same effect. Now let's run this. 55 is the correct answer, but we got lucky. Remember, uninitialized variables do not necessarily have a default value. We got away with it here because REPL is obviously putting in a default value of zero. But on different operating systems using different compilers, you could get junk values instead. It's always best to initialize your values. Writing a loop generally like this using variables means that it's easy to change the values. What about the sum of integers 1 up to 100? What about 10,000? Let's do this again, but instead of a sum, let's take a product. I initialize my variable product here to 1 because I'm going to take 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 all the way up to and including times n. This is correct, but again, we can do some shorthands here. In fact, we can change where we start the loop. Since product already starts out at one, there's no need to multiply it by one again. And we can skip one iteration of the loop. This is, of course, the factorial function. 
let's try it for larger values. Clearly something went wrong. This is overflow. Remember that the maximum value that an integer can hold is roughly about 2.147 billion. 20 factorial is much bigger than that. So it's not able to hold the full value, and instead it wraps around to negative values, giving us this incorrect value. We'll get some more practice later on.